Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm just continually so happy at our attendance and interest in this series. Uh, it's been excellent, those of you who are following it, as you know. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Haley. I work for the uh, Columbia Mountains Institute, and I'm here to welcome you today. Um, for those of you who have been following along, this is the point in the series where I start to apologize for a little bit of uh, redundance. I'm going to do an introduction that you're already familiar with, but um, we have to run through it. And for the benefit of those who haven't been with us here today, it's really important. Um, so, of course, welcome. That's my my main goal is to, to welcome you here today and um, tell you a little bit about your host organizations, this series that we are embarking on, and um, of course, our speaker. So, like I said, I work with the Columbia Mountains Institute, and I'm joined here by Marcy Marr and Kendall Banesh from the Kootenai Conservation Program. So that's KCP for short. Uh, Columbia Mountains Institute is CMI for short. And we have joined forces. Uh, we've brought together the, Colum or the, the CRED Talks, the Columbia Region Ecological Discussions, and KCP's popular and excellent winter webinar series into one. So this season of webinars uh, has a theme, and it's the Foundations of Resilience, Understanding Departures from Historical Ecosystems and Adapting for Resilient Futures. And we're welcoming seven speakers who will draw on patterns from the past, challenges from the present, and scenarios for the future to explore adapting ecosystems for resilience in the Columbia Basin. This year's CRED Talks and KCP's Winter Webinar Series is financially supported by the Columbia Basin Trust. Many thanks to the Trust for helping us to get this up and off the ground. Now, today we're going to be listening to PH candidate Jen Barron, and I'll be introducing her in a little bit more detail in a moment. But before I do that, um, as has been our routine, I'd like to take a moment to pause and acknowledge the land that I broadcast from here today and the Indigenous uh, peoples of that land. So in Revelstoke, BC, uh, where I live, this is the homeland, the unceded homeland of the Sinaiq people. The Shaquapam people have also stewarded this land for millennia, and the Tanaha call this valley the land of the chickadee in their creation stories. The Okanagan Nation Alliance also expressed strong connections to this place. Um, what I would like to do now is pass it over to you. So using the chat, as some of you have already, please feel free to introduce yourself Share your name, the organization you work with, perhaps, and the territory or territories that you zoom in from. It'd be great. This is a fantastic way of testing out the chat because, as you'll see, you'll probably be using it a little bit later on. Okay. So I needed to advance a slide. Um, and I should have done that a little bit earlier, so I'll just pause. This gives you a nice list of what you can expect in the series, some of the talks that have already been presented and some of the talks that are still to come. Okay, so I'm not seeing much in the chat just yet, but as those come in, I'm going to move on to tell you a little bit about one of your host organizations, CMI. So CMI, as many of you know, are um, is a nonprofit organization and association for people working in, where's my note? Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Here we go, okay. Um, and we're an association for people working in various fields of ecology. Our home range of course is Southern British Columbia, Canada, but our membership extends across BC into Alberta, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. One of the main things we do is provide professional development opportunities and, and those come in many forms such as conferences, courses, and of course, webinars, and they deal with everything from skill-based research techniques to more complex land management conundrums. Our website is the best place to learn about the things we do, and it contains great resources such as proceedings documents and talk recordings um, from all of our major events, and you can find these at cmiae.org. Now, at this stage, what I would like to do is pass it over to Marcy Marr, um, we'll tell you a little bit about the Kootenai Conservation Program. Thanks, Haley. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Haley said, my name is Marcy Marr, and I'm joining you on behalf of the Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP. And our work occurs in the unceded 
traditional territories of the Chinaha, the Shwepnek, the Sinaiks, and the Silks Okanagan peoples who've lived here and cared for the land, water, and wildlife since time immemorial. We're a broad partnership of 85 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, indigenous nations, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays. And our mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and to generate the support and resources necessary to maintain this effort, including building technical knowledge in webinars like this one. So we're excited to be hosting this webinar series with CMI, and I'm a CNI, CMI member and great organization. And um, we would love to give additional appreciation to our program sponsors, without whom uh, we would not be able to do this type of work. So now just a couple of housekeeping details, and, and then we'll get started. So this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on CMI's events uh, webpage within a week. And we ask that you remain muted unless you're asking a question during the Q&A uh, at the end of the talk after Jen's presentation. And then please note, we'll be using the chat function as our Q&A. So while Jen is giving her presentation, um, feel free to add a question in the chat at any time and know that we'll adjust, address your questions uh, at the end of uh, Jen Barron's talk. Thanks, and oh, back to you, uh, Haley. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So um, now we're going to get on with why you're all here today. And I'm feeling a little bit better. Uh, I apologize for my rocky start there. My screen was cutting in and out and in and out. And um, I realized that I had a cord loose. So I fixed it now. Um, okay. So I would like to introduce Jen Barron. Um, and I want to note that Jen Barron's actually been working behind the scenes with me from the beginning and has been instrumental in curating the speaker list for this series. So if you have been enjoying the series, um, let's send an extra thanks her way and um, welcome her here today. So Jen's gonna be introducing a talk called Reintroducing Fire as a Process, Restoring Disrupted Fire Regimes Across Landscapes. And I'd like to just read a short bio. Jen is a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia and a researcher for the Pacific Institute of Climate Solutions and Canada Wildfire Strategic Network. Her doctoral research combines theory and application to address landscape change and fire risk through past trends and contemporary management decisions. She aims to understand how legacies of colonization, fire suppression, and fuel accumulation shape current and future regimes and how the strategic application of treatments can restore fire adapted ecosystems at a landscape scale. So we're really fortunate to have you here today, Jen. Thanks for joining us. I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks, Haley. Okay. How does that look? Looks great. All right, okay. So thanks, Haley, very much for the introduction. Um, as Haley said, I'm a PhD candidate at UBC Forestry in Vancouver. Uh, but my doctoral research is really focused on the uh, Columbia Mountains region and in particular uh, the Rocky Mountain Trench and the adjacent ecosystems. So <clears throat> going right into it, uh, this is a picture from near Invermere in 1906. This is overlooking Ellis and Stoda Ranch. Um, and as you can see, this ecosystem looks very different than it might today. So we see a pretty open grassland, open forest range, uh, variable species composition uh, as well, lots of fire adapted species, um, and more of a patchwork mosaic in the montane and more alpine systems. Randy Harris was nice enough to go back and take this picture again for us in 2018, and we see a pretty different landscape today. So one of the starkest contrasts is the number of trees at low elevation. And this is pretty widely regarded in the trench that there has been a ton of infilling and encroachment on grasslands. But there's more subtle trends in there as well. So in addition to the infilling of trees, there's also the homogenization of forests. Um, so instead of a wider diversity of species, we see a lot of this infilling is from a single species, in particular, juvenile Douglas fir. We also see that montane region doesn't look quite as patchy. It's filled in as well, 
Um, and that occurs at the mid elevations and right up to the top. <clears throat> and now here's a picture in Invermere from Labor Day in 1949. And here the Forest Service is telling us that fires destroy game. And so to keep our forest green, we must prevent forest fires. This messaging was pretty widespread throughout North America, uh, beginning in the mid 20th century. And uh, it's had a lot of benefits in terms of the protection of communities, but it's also had a lot of consequences in terms of ecosystems. So this is a picture from uh, within this area today. And this is what a lot of those forests look like as a result of the absence of fire. But rewinding a little bit, fire regime disruption didn't begin in 1949 uh, when we began suppressing fire. It actually began at colonization. So historical fire regimes in this region and throughout dry forests uh, across North America included surface fire components that were intentionally maintained by Indigenous people. Um, and in this region, the Tanaha and Sequetmik have stewarded this land for 10,000 years, uh, and in particular, grasslands were very important to the way of life. They were historically maintained through low severity surface fires set in the fall to produce foods and medicines, influence the movement of wildlife, reduce forest encroachment, and for spiritual and cultural values. And this impact of fire wasn't just at the low elevation grasslands, but there's also evidence of it in the mid-montane forests for travel corridors uh, and other values. However, indigenous fire stewardship was systematically discouraged during the late 19th century, driven by colonial policies which sought to weaken and eliminate Indigenous cultures. So rewinding uh, back to some work that we saw earlier in this series, this is a fire history reconstruction from Greg Green, and we have extensive research on historical fire frequency throughout this region. Um, so in addition to this study of 20 plots, we have another 160 plots um, <clears throat> located throughout this region, recording 822 years of fire history across different ecosystem types and elevational gradients. And so Greg's work found that there was very frequent fire in particular uh, in those low elevation zones in the Southern Rocky Mountain Trench with site averages of seven to 15 years historically from both lightning, and, uh, lightning ignitions and indigenous stewardship and that today these forests have gone between 50 and 140 years without fire. I combined this information with uh, a number of other fire history studies and mapped historical fire return interval to different uh, ecosystem types using Beck subzones. So we assigned a historical fire return interval uh, to different ecosystem types throughout this region to try to get an idea of how departed these systems are today. And these can be broadly grouped in th into three different classes. Uh, low severity fire regimes where fire would have burned frequently, but with low impact, most of the trees would have survived. High severity, which would have been infrequent fire that killed most trees. And mixed severity fire regimes, which would have involved uh, a mix of both low and high severity components. We decided to use uh, historical fire perimeter information to try to link the disruption in historical fire regimes from prior to colonization through the 20th century and into today. So this, this project used a fire perimeters data set uh, maintained by the BC Wildfire Service that contains every fire event on record since 1919. Uh, in this data set, uh, more recent fire perimeters come from continued fire mapping, um, from uh, remotely sensed data sets, um, forest inventory, et cetera. The historical fire perimeters come from a, a project that digitized and georeferenced historical fire maps. Um, and these come from uh, historical maps um, in historical fire suppression records and inventories. We looked at a few attributes in this data set, specifically the number of fires annually, the area burned, and the mean fire size separated out by fire cause. And using statistical methods, we found three distinct phases of fire activity or fire regimes, 1919 to 1939, 1940 to 2002, and then 2003 to present. <clears throat> In the early 20th century, we found that fires were frequent and large, with 40% of the flammable landscape experiencing a fire event. 
Although fires occurred abundantly during the droughts and positive warm phases of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation from about 1925 to 1945, they were already different in cause and severity from pre-colonial fire regimes, having already been altered by a century of colonial land uses. Specifically, widespread 19th century land clearing for homesteads and agricultural use by settlers, often using fire, served as conveyor belts for spreading very large early 20th century ignitions. Intentional and accidental ignitions associated with resource extraction, like hill slope burning, loggers using machinery and locomotives, and the expansion of railroads was also common during this period and contributed to the large fires of the era. However, it's important to note that although large portions of the landscape were burning, this was still significantly departed from pre-colonial fire regimes, both in the cause and the severity of fires. From 1940 to 2002, we see wildfire activity rapidly decline, with only 8% of this landscape burning and a 740-year fire return interval. Following the Second World War, several technologies were adopted to fight the war on wildfire with the integration of the military incident command system and technologies like aerial imagery, heavy machinery, and aerial attack fleets. Cool and wet climate conditions in the 40s and 50s provided time for newly augmented fire suppression systems and technologies to develop as suppression personnel and equipment became more widely integrated. As the climate began to shift to warmer conditions with climate change and a warm PDO phase beginning in the late 70s, a potential increase in fire activity was met by additional advances in wildfire science and technology, including the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System, and the fire weather index system, which helped keep fire activity low. Notable fire seasons with multiple fire events escaping suppression became relatively rare and only occurred under more extreme fire weather conditions, like in 1985. In 2003, an exceptional fire season in BC threatened multiple communities and exceeded suppression capabilities. We identified a phase transition in fire activity in 2003, after which point burned area and mean fire size increased. The fire rate return interval during this time period decreased, meaning fires have become more frequent, but still remains clearly departed from pre-management era fire frequency. These levels of fire activity are lower than those of the early 20th century, and under low to moderate fire weather conditions, wildfire suppression remains highly effective. However, increasingly when fires escape suppression, they exhibit dangerous fire behavior occurring under the most extreme fire weather conditions that are influenced by climate change. Decreasing summer precipitation, prolonged extreme temperatures, and drought clearly enabled recent extreme fire seasons in 2017, 2018, and 2021. Thinking about a bit about ignition cause as well, human ignitions decreased in the 1940s and have largely remained low since, likely in part due to the success of public messaging. <clears throat> However, the continued growth of the wildland urban interface into highly fire prone environments further increases the potential for human ignitions and hazardous fuels and the likelihood that fires will be suppressed to protect values. Patterns of aggressive fire suppression are evident uh, in the Rocky Mountain Trench in this map where you can see at low elevation, the red human ignitions are very small, meaning that they're suppressed very quickly. This is where population density is highest and uh, fire suppression attack is most effective. However, this is also historically where fire frequency was the highest. And so this now creates a volatile environment for high severity fires that may threaten communities. In contrast, lightning is a major driver of fire activity and the relative importance of uh, lightning ignitions to area burned and mean fire sized is increasing. Lightning ignitions drove the 2003 shift in fire activity and were responsible for 80% of total fire events and 97% of area burn since 2010. This may be in part because we've gotten better at detecting lightning and lightning ignited fires. However, research also suggests that climate change is increasing the frequency of lightning discharges and lightning caused fires in the Pacific Northwest, which is favored by the increased frequency of dry convective atmospheric conditions or dry lightning. Human factors related to management suppression likely also contribute to patterns in lightning ignitions and escape fires. For example, lightning ignitions are less likely to be immediately suppressed, are more likely to occur in the backcountry and in clusters, and are better candidates for managed wildfires, which may also um, contribute to their greater contribution to area burned. Finally, using those estimates of historical fire return intervals that I showed you, 
we mapped uh, a measure of fire deficits, uh, fire regime interval departure. So this is a measure of how often a forest burns today relative to how often it burned in the past. So values less than one represent no fire deficit and values greater than one represent the number of fires missed. Hmm. So we found that at least 46% of this landscape is in a large fire deficit. And I say at least because if a historical fire return interval was greater than 100 years, we only had 100 years of fire perimeter data. So we couldn't evaluate departure in some of those higher elevation forests. This means that the majority of this landscape is departed from historical fire frequency. Dry low elevation forests uh, in the Southern Rocky Mountain Trench are the most departed, uh, missing between six and 10 fire return intervals. And this is due both to the pre-colonial frequency of low severity surface fires and the extremely effective exclusion of fire over the past century, creating a large fire deficit. Mid-Montane and lower subalpine forests are also departed, missing at least one to six fire return intervals, and having lost active fire from mixed severity fire regimes due to effective fire exclusion. This level of departure presents a fundamental challenge for modern wildfire management and underpins contemporary fire risk. One of the fundamental consequences of fire deficits is fuel accumulation. So in this figure, the top uh, panel C shows a fire maintained by a low to, a forest maintained by a low to mixed severity surface fire. So we can see uh, some uh, surface fire moving on the ground, um, some younger trees being removed, and periodic low severity surface fire within these forests and prevent higher severity fire from occurring um, over time. Panel D shows uh, the impact of fire exclusion in these forests. So we can see a lot of inf infilling, a lot of mortality, both from disturbances and also from competition. And if a fire were to ignite in this forest, it would burn at higher severity, it would kill more trees. And I'll just remind you what that landscape looks like today relative to what it looked like in the past. So if under the right fire weather conditions an ignition occurred, this could create a higher severity fire than this ecosystem is adapted to. And so the consequence is that the heterogeneity maintained by these active fire regimes was lost. Frequent small surface fires would have created a patchy landscape that would have created feedbacks that prevented higher severity fires from occurring. Instead, on the modern landscape, we see increased fuel density and contiguity, altered species compositions towards fire intolerant monocultures, and homogenization at patch, stand, and landscape levels, uh, replacing a mosaic of forest and non-forest patches with a continuous fuels matrix. As a result, current conditions are more vulnerable to the direct and indirect effects of uh, increases in drought and fire, especially under a rapidly warming climate. One of the concerns of this is that these fire deficits don't occur only in forests. They also occur near communities. So where those fire deficits were the greatest is also where most of the communities in the trench uh, run directly through. This means that uh, there is likely a strong accumulation of fuels in these locations whereby human ignitions would require a very quick response, especially under extreme fire weather conditions. In addition, lightning ignitions in the backcountry would also occur in locations where there's been fuel accumulation and fire deficits, and these might threaten escape and threaten to burn into communities through some of these highly accumulated fuels. The main concern with this is in particular over extreme fire weather conditions and resources during extreme fire seasons. Ecologically, another one of the concerns with these fire deficits is that if they do burn at, fire, at high severity, they may not come back as forests. So when a forest burns at high severity, uh, that altered disturbance regime can overcome historical fire forest resilience to maintain the general structure or composition of previous forests. Forest recovery uh, after high severity fire can be compromised by lack of seed sources, a warmer and drier climate, and short interval reburning. So this picture shows a, the Canyon Ferry burn in Montana 17 years post fire where post-fire surveys suggest there has been little to no recruitment at lower elevations in Ponderosa Pine and Douglas fir forests. Thinking about how to address some of these fire deficits, uh, we turn to the literature on what evidence-based management interventions are. So in order to effectively reduce the risk of high severity fire, you have to remove fuel from the system. This is in contrast to fuel rearrangement treatments. So things like thinning, 
where the fuel is, is not uh, removed and either pile burned or used uh, with a prescribed fire or removed from the system for different purposes like bioeconomy. In this situation, this can actually increase fire severity depending on the arrangement of the fuels and the conditions that an ignition might occur under. <clears throat> and of course, this is the no action scenario fuel accumulation. Um, this is a high risk for a high severity fire if an ignition were to occur. In terms of different options for how to accomplish these different goals, uh, fuel reduction can be accomplished with uh, thinning and removing fuel from the system, prescribed fire and cultural fire, and managed wildfires. So ignitions that happen um, in more remote locations that instead of being immediately suppressed are held at a maximum perimeter. In contrast, fuel rearrangement occurs when thinning happens, but the fuel isn't removed from the system. And fuel accumulation occurs under continued fire suppression. Thinking a little bit about the province's current strategy to address fire risk, a lot of money uh, and resources have been in invested in the Fire Smart program, uh, which is largely targeted at homeowners. So reducing fire risk to homeowners, um, which requires individual buy-in for properties and is broadly focused on buffers around communities. This is very effective uh, in situations that directly occur within community, but in cases where fires burn into community or around community, these treatments alone likely will not be effective at addressing the accumulation of fuels across the landscape. So in addition to Fire Smart, the province invests in fuel mitigation programs, and there's been an expansion of prescribed fire programs and wildfire risk reduction over recent years. However, looking at our current success at reducing fuels, we're not really meeting the mark. We're treating probably maybe 5,000 hectares a year. And this isn't compared to in the 70s and 80s when we used to treat much larger areas, primarily for uh, silviculture and wildlife habitat. Another challenge with these treatments is that they're ephemeral. So even an area that was treated 10 years ago will need to be treated again on a schedule. We're limited in capacity and also limited in risk tolerance, and the future of funding for these programs is not guaranteed. So thinking about scaling up some of these treatments, this context around fire deficits means that managing fuels and restoring fire will require working across agencies and managing for different values. So we need to more seriously consider how restoration uh, and fuel reduction treatments can interact with other landscape components and how they can better work together to meet mutual goals. Uh, so this is an example of the layout of a landscape with different values. So for example, in the wildland urban interface, the main priority is wildfire risk reduction to communities. In the managed wildfire zone, this is an area where under moderate fire weather conditions, uh, an ignition may remove some fuel from the system in a way that isn't going to threaten other values. Uh, areas that are known to be important for um, wildlife habitat may be managed at different densities than areas that are important for um, berry production, for example. And so there is no single density or composition that makes sense for these landscapes, both from an ecological point of view and a human landscape point of view, but instead to consider the different values we have on those landscapes and how to arrange them strategically next to each other to prioritize our values. So thinking about this specifically within the Columbia region, there are a lot of values on this landscape and restoring fire regimes will require cross-jurisdictional management for wildfire risk mitigation, uh, indigenous community values, ecosystem restoration, watershed protection, wildlife habitat, bioeconomy and timber, and range and cattle, just to name a few. There's a lot more values on this landscape than I could list on one slide. Um, and so, of course, sometimes these interests are not always in line, and that requires making decisions around prioritization of values. For example, most people agree that wildfire risk mit mitigation is a priority immediately adjacent to a community uh, versus Wildlife habitat may be very important in a region that's known as a wildlife movement cor corridor. There's also a need to think about these treatments beyond the suppression mindset. So reminding you again that in the past, these forests were able to be maintained at a broad landscape scale because of stabilizing feedbacks. So if our goal of treatments is to increase fire suppression effectiveness, we are putting ourselves back in the situa same situation that got us ourselves into the problem in the first place. So if we treat it to prevent burning, it will always need to be treated. The goal is to treat it so that an ignition can occur there 
and it does not require suppression or does not require extensive resources for suppression and can burn with the benefits to the ecosystem and the reduction of fuel, but without the consequences of threatening communities. So instead, the goal is to reintroduce fires as a more beneficial and benign process uh, with the idea that if we treat now, we can reintroduce fire so that we do not have to treat later. There's also a need to increase capacity around who can apply treatments and where priorities lie. So if we're going to address the scale of this problem, we need to scale up beyond uh, the current limitations uh, around treatments. So this is an example of a landowner led prescribed burn association in Nebraska working uh, together to reduce encroachment and restore grasslands. And so this of course would be specifically for the values um, of these landowners um, across rangelands. And these types of, for example, prescribed burn associations could, could be formed uh, to support different values and with different uh, practitioners. And I'll also add that there is a growing uh, academic recognition of the importance of returning sovereignty to Indigenous communities to restore active fire. So cultural fire is essential for decolonization and uh, the restoration of culture and lands. And this must ensure that authority and governance is returned to Indigenous communities. For example, cultural fire can be viewed as a fuels treatment um, but reintroducing active fire regimes without giving authority to the Indigenous communities that once maintained them will perpetuate the management decisions that created those fire deficits in the first place. And finally, this map shows the air temperature anomalies the day before Lytton experienced a destructive fire on June 2021. And so thinking a little bit back to Eric and Janine's talk about uh, the concept of resilience, um, novel eco ecosystems and no analog futures. Um, what are the implications of these changes in fire regimes considering this context? So I wanna think a little bit about what parts of the landscape, landscape do we manage and does it make sense to manage? It is likely not possible to return the ecosystem to the 1950s or 1900 or 1800 composition. And we likely don't want to based on our values today. So instead, we want to think about restoring uh, conditions that might produce stabilizing feedbacks in locations where those values are important, accepting that some ecosystems will change. So for example, some forests will burn at high severity and they will transition to other types of ecosystems. What are the consequences of that? And what resources do we have? What interventions do we have to potentially produce a more desirable outcome? And thinking a little bit about using the past as a guide, uh, different analog systems, for example, lots of frequent fire systems throughout the Rocky Mountains stretching down to Mexico to serve as reference, and based on the values of the system and our desires for what we want these systems to produce for us and what's possible. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jen. So I uh, encourage folks to put their questions in the chat. And as folks are doing that, um, Jen, you mentioned something that I'm really interested in and, and not sure I know the answer to, hopefully you do, is the difference between prescribed burning and cultural burning when you were talking about the, the different um, management interventions. Um, yeah, what's the difference there? Right, okay. So prescribed burning is a very broad classification. It's essentially, essentially the uh, intentional application of fire um, often, but not always by agency um, for a specific reason or value. And when we talk about cultural fire, cultural fire refers specifically to indigenous cultural fire um, for community values, cultural values that are independent from, for example, a government organization. Um, and so cultural fire can be viewed as a fuels treatment, but the objective of cultural fire is not inherently a, just a fuels treatment. Um, and the most important thing with cultural fire is that it lies in the hands of Indigenous communities. So an agency cannot do a cultural burn, a community has to do the burn for it to be cultural fire for their values. Great, thanks so much. Um, so other questions from folks? Let me look in the chat here. Yeah, so is your research, um, okay, so I'm not see. I see Casey. Uh, in your research, what is the most limiting factor in the Rocky Mountain Trench area? 
limiting factor in terms of getting treatments done? Is that the... Casey, do you want to unmute yourself and maybe provide a clarification here? Oh, okay. figure what thumb went up. Okay. Um, most limiting factor, I would say um, risk aversion, not from um, the communities, but from the overarching organizations that give a go or no go on a lot of treatments um, and capacity. We're really limited on capacity. Um, so for example, often in the spring or fall, you only have one or two days that are good to burn and maybe, you know, two or three agencies are kind of burning at the same time, but we need to get to the point where either can have multiple burns happening on the same day with the same organization um, and have enough personnel to be able to manage those burns. So there's just really limited training available right now, limited prioritization on prescribed burning independently and fuel treatments independently from fire suppression um, within the broader framework. And so having prescribed fire and fuels treatments be an independent uh, source for training, for funding, um, for personnel allocation is, is one of the, the main ways to increase capacity. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Oh, Casey says, I agree, yeah. I have a question if I, if I can. Yes, yeah, sure, Sky. Um, I am dealing with more and more clients these days that are required to have a fire smart approved landscape plan for developments um, that they're doing. Most of the time it's private homeowners, but sometimes it's uh, for larger developments. And one question that crossed my mind recently was um, they are specifically pushing homeowners into choosing different species that um, are less resinous or create less fuels. And I wonder from a habitat perspective, um, how that is going to change our landscape over time and what are the implications that you know of or anyone else could speak to uh, for wildlife, uh, for potential future wildlife trees if we're not putting ponderosa pine back in um, and we're having to choose other shrubs or alternative trees. What does that mean for the wildlife? Yeah, that's a good question, especially around balancing values. And in that case, the value uh, isn't necessarily even around fire ecology or fire regimes, but more around fire risk reduction near homes. Um, and my understanding of those fire smart principles is they're really focused on that buffer that's immediately adjacent to the home, like within 10 meters of the home. But I'm assuming some of those plans might mandate things over, you know, much broader properties. So I think immediately adjacent to properties. I kind of agree that fire hazard risk reduction should be the priority, but if it's over a much larger property, especially because ponderosa pine, you know, was so common in a lot of these forests historically, and we have lost a lot of ponderosa pine forests, um, I think that there should be some kind of um, scenario or incentive to include species compositions that make sense ecologically for that region. Um, if you have, you know, a reasonably large buffer zone around the home and you're not planting them at densities that are gonna be high wildfire risk, which at Ponderosa Pine is pretty unlikely. Great, that was a great question. So we've got another one here about, um, that speaks to the multi-jurisdictional management that you you had referred to in your talk and how how can we be encouraging private landowners to to do more landscape level treatments or be involved you know with uh, crown managers in looking at the landscape together for how the private crown interface is managed yeah so Private land treatments that I've been involved in have primarily been with municipalities, so that's technically consider considered private land, and municipalities seem to have, you know, in, in the trench, Cranbrook and Kimberley seem to have strong incentive to do treatments. Um, but for smaller scale private landowners, I would argue that there needs to be more incentive um, in order to subsidize the cost of some of those treatments. Um, and to make them more cost effective as well. So there uh, are currently some arguments for reallocating fuels from fuel treatments towards bioeconomy pathways, which might offset some of the cost of recovering those fuels. Um, but there's also a large sector that hasn't been tapped into that used to treat a lot and doesn't treat anymore, and that's licensees. 
Uh, licensees used to do a lot of burning, a lot of fuel reduction at the landscape level. And right now, most of these fuel treatments that are happening, uh, even if they're being done on Crown land, um, they're not being done by the licensees as part of their silvicultural treatments. Um, so I think that we also need to have incentive for licensees to do more of these treatments with the information that they have, with the personnel that they have, and to provide training um, to do that fuel reduction and not just the, the fuel rearrangement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dennis is asking, with increasing spread of invasive species across the landscape, there's a concern that introducing fire causes more issues than it solves. How do we balance this in relation to resilience that we're seeking on the landscape? Yeah, the invasive species question comes up a lot. And I think it's a really good one. And I, again, think it comes back to values. So I would argue that if you are doing a fuel treatment immediately adjacent to a community and the primary goal is wildfire risk reduction, um, then reintroducing native invasive or introducing invasives into the system is something that can be addressed after some of the fuel is removed. So the idea isn't just treat it and leave it, but instead treat it and then you're likely going to get invasives either way and then address those invas invasives when they come up. If the objective is ecological restoration, obviously it needs to be much more explicit in the planning process in terms of when you're doing treatments, how you're addressing the invasives, the seed mixes that you're using, et cetera. So I think the approach is different in, in different cases. Um, I would, I'm not sure I would agree that it's better it's better to leave it than to not because the consequence of leaving it is that high severity fire where it potentially shifts to some other system entirely. And that might be a desirable system. It might not, but the reality is the system's gonna change either way. Okay. Uh, and a question here from Regan. Uh, have you encountered some recent examples of co-managed and indigenous led burning that can provide a roadmap to these practices? Um, spreading and becoming case studies, I guess, for 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 others. Uh, or what what else um, is a hurdle? Sorry. Or else, what's one hurdle you would eliminate to encourage more? Yeah. So I do know that BC Wildfire Service um, and Finesse are starting to try to do some of this work, and I, I have been involved in with Finesse on some of their landscape level planning and their cultural and prescribed fire program. Um, I do think that there are other places that we can look to. Um, for example, there's tons of cultural burning that happens in California uh, with the nations down there, um, as well as expertise around how to navigate some of the hurdles, um, as well as Australia has, you know, uh, pretty widespread programs um, and, you know, indigenous governance around cultural fire. One of the biggest hurdles that I see is trying to make cultural fire fit within a fire agency framework. So having to come up with a burn plan with holding and PPE, especially for these really small burns that are, you know, during pretty, uh, they're gonna be very low, very low severity burns. And the idea that you would need, you know, like a water tanker to burn like half a hectare seems a little bit overkill. Like some of the requirements around, you know, Nomex, all of the stuff that you would have for, for a larger burn, for a small community burn, I think is one of the biggest barriers like that would prevent somebody from wanting to plan a fire like that. Okay, thanks. Ah, oh, next question. You're doing great, Jen. <laughs> We've got plenty of time. So um, folks, feel free to, to put your questions in the chat uh, for Jen here. So uh, in view of the contentions surrounding reforestation uh, to monocultures, um, what are your thoughts on how this affects long-term biodiversity and fuel composition? Yeah, so I think there is a lot of concern specifically around fuel accumulation with replanting, but also with natural regeneration, just because um, of the density at which things are naturally regenerating, um, creating fuel accumulation, um, and biodiversity would be a pretty similar uh, concern. So com in compare to how these forests would have regenerated naturally after these kind of patchier burns, the impact of logging and then reforestation creates a totally different fuels mosaic and a totally different forest composition. Um, and I think that long term, this might actually perpetuate some of those shifts that we're going to see. So 
it might be, you know, a monoculture of Douglas fir for a while, but then it might be converted into a shrubland eventually because of those consequences of uh, disturbance. So compounding, you know, insect outbreaks. We're seeing Douglas fir beetle uh, in combination with some high severity fires, and those forests may not regenerate the way that they came back historically. So I think that those compositions are actually in, in the long term going to be uh, a blip. I don't think that they're going to be sustained on the landscape long term. Okay. And uh, Phil is asking, how can we best address the liability issues associated with planned burns that have gone awry? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a liability expert on prescribed fire, so I'm I'm not sure what the best approach is. But I, I do know that there is concern in doing more prescribed fire that if one fire goes wrong, we're going to lose our license entirely to do that. And we've seen that happen, you know, in the US in, in recent years. Um, the liability concern is very important. Um, the reality is that a lot of these areas are going to burn and it's likely better that they burn when we have, you know, personnel and ability to respond than they burn during extreme fire weather when we have nobody available and they burn much hotter and much more severe. Um, so I think, Liability and escapes are a big concern. Um, having su legislative support to be able to do these kinds of treatments instead of uh, doing nothing, which is a choice. Uh, continuing to suppress all fires is a management decision. It's not uh, a do nothing scenario. Um, is really important. So I would say, like on the policy um, and like provincial legislative support, that's where that comes in on the liability front. Okay. Uh, and then Richard's asking, are you aware of any correlation between lightning strikes with slope, aspect, and forest age? Yeah, so um, my understanding of, well, I'm not a climatologist, but my understanding of lightning in the, in the climate system is that it's more strongly correlated with things like, um, yes, with slope, like with um, topography, and also with the uh, climate system moving through. But in terms of lightning ignitions, um, they do tend to happen uh, more in the backcountry, so those forests would be more along the lines of like those uh, mixed fir, lodgepole, pine, and even some of the spruce stands. Um, in terms of aspect and forest age, that's more of a, more related to fire behavior. So there's the ignitions, and then there's the actual fire events, and the slope and aspect that they would be maintained under would be based on whether an ignition actually is sustained in that stand. Um, but a lot of it is also related to suppression. So it's pretty hard to tell from these data sets what is an impact of fire behavior of, in and of itself and what is a artifact of suppression because we have very little information other than the actual fire perimeters of how these fires were actioned um, or whether backburns were done, planned ignitions were done into those fires um, or you know the extent to which water tankers were used. So it's actually quite hard to study fire behavior in a lot of these systems. Okay. Great. Um, and Decker's wondering when a forest has heavy fuel fuel accumulation. Sorry, fuel accumulation. Um, do you go in and manage that first uh, in terms of fire, or uh, should you do selective logging or something else? What should be done first? I mean, ideally, we would be able to go in and do selective log logging on most of these accumulated fuels, but the scale that they're at is just much larger than any area we could ever treat. So the idea behind managed wildfire is that it's going to burn, it's not immediately adjacent to a high value resource, and so let's let it burn under conditions where uh, we can control it versus let it burn under extreme fire weather when we can't control it. Um, Depending on the fuel accumulation as well as the historical uh, stand composition, sometimes managed fire is appropriate, but it, it's usually not that a specific stand is blocked for a managed wildfire. It's more that a fire ignition happens um, and BC Wildfire Service says, you know, we can let this burn um, versus uh, a thinning treatment or selective log logging would be planned for that specific block. So at a, at a broad level, at a zoned level, a lot of those higher elevation areas could be, you know, zoned out for managed wildfire. But if there's a specific reason why a thinning treatment might make sense, for example, if there's, um, you know, 
uh, an economic benefit to, to thinning in that area, like for bioeconomy, or if it's adjacent to important wildlife habitat, or if it is important wildlife habitat, then that would be a justification to do a treatment. Okay. Well, that was one, that was our last question. I'm just wondering if there's anything else that anyone would like to ask. One just popped up in the chat, Marcy. Oh, okay. Switching over to that. Okay, another one from Casey. Uh, have you looked at old growth deferral areas as they relate to and often conflict with doing more treatments in the Rocky Mountain Trench? Yeah, the old growth, I mean, the Ogmas and the old growth deferral areas are kind of a whole can of worms as far as management areas go. Um, it definitely creates some challenges. I think that a lot of people are very invested in, in the old growth conversation. Um, and where some of those deferral areas have been placed just based on the types of data we have at the provincial scale um, are really old. They are old trees, but they don't provide a lot of value and they're not what people think of when they think of old growth. Like I've seen, you know, 150 year old trees in the trench that are super suppressed that are like this big that could potentially be zoned as an old growth deferral area. So I think having better data um on what those forests actually look like and some understanding of the values of those forests might help deal with some of that but again from a legislative point of view so we we have a master's student in our lab who i think is on this call georgina preston who's looking at the impact of mule deer winter range and old growth management area um, around preventing treatments around communities um and what the values actually are in those forests and what the impact would be if we could do a treatment there so i think having more context and be, uh, being able to have those um, those areas be flexible based on some better data and more information would probably be a benefit to communities. Okay, uh, and another one's in from uh, Bailey, and she says, in Asia where people still do low intensity annual burns, air quality is poor during that season. So what are your thoughts on this uh, if we increase managed burns? Right, yeah. Um, so I think the assumption that we're going to have years, you know, that every year is going to be without smoke is, is not really a realistic or attainable goal. It's something that was attainable through the 20th century because we were so good at fire suppression, but as we're seeing, we can't maintain that. And so, you know, I don't want to say people have been saying for a long time, how do you want your smoke? And I think that's a bit of a harsh way to say it, but it's true that the smoke from a prescribed fire is much less intense than the smoke you would get from really intense fire seasons. And even if we don't have a bad fire season in BC, we get a lot of smoke transport from places like California, Washington that might be having, and the boreal, which might be having a bad fire season. Um, the benefit with the plant ignition is that at least um, you can tell the community about it. And we can also increase infrastructure around communities to address some of that smoke. Um, and hopefully it'll be shorter term in nature than the high severity smoke you would get you know, for months at a time throughout the fire season. But I, I do think that smoke to some extent is unavoidable, um, but the, there are, you know, very strong health consequences to smoke. So building infrastructure and educating communities around smoke risks is also very important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, Jen, you have done a fabulous job fielding lots of questions um, after a really great presentation. So thank you so much for everything you've shared today. And um, Haley, I'll pass it over to you for closure. Sounds great. Um, I'll just share a screen, but while I do that, I just echoed that what such fantastic questions, everybody. Thank you so much. And I just love all the sharing of resources in the chat. And um, thanks to Marcy for facilitating that Q&A so seamlessly. Um, we're just gonna follow up and end with some thank yous. So thanks to Jen, again, thanks for making time to share your work with us and um, continuing to reach out and be involved in our communities um, and being invested in, um, in all of this really important work. Uh, thanks also to the Columbia Basin Trust for your financial support. Thanks to KCP um, for your support and involvement um, and hosting of this series and to KCP's core funders. So of course we couldn't do this without you. And what I would like to do now is just um, give you a little teaser for next week. Um, so Jen could tell you more about who we're going to expect next week. But what I'll tell you right now is just that I, we've got um, a group of four 
who I think are going to be pretty fun. And they are going, they're the folks who are actively managing fire on the ground. So we'll be welcoming Robert Gray, Colleen Ross, Kaya Allen, and Dr. Carly Phillips. And they're going to be delivering a talk called Prescribed Fire and Adapting for Resilient Futures. Um, I think it'll be pretty dynamic and um, it'll be same day, same time next week, February 23rd to 12 p.m. Pacific, cmiae.org for registration and details, um, or just reach out to me if you have any questions. So that's it. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great afternoon.